I'm sure you're as eager for his presentation as me. So without further ado, let's give a very warm virtual welcome to him. Jeff, over to you. Uh, thank you, um, Larry. Let me share my screen. Looks great, and the presentation mode. Okay, and I'll put it uh, to the laser pointer. Okay, today I wanna to talk about uh, synthesizing single crystal NMC in a one-step process that uses no water and generates no waste. So this work was done by uh, Matthew Garrett, Ning Zhang, and Savina Yu primarily at Dalhousie University. And all the work here was done at the university. So about 30 years ago, uh, my research group started looking at nickel manganese systems uh, to see what benefits or attributes adding manganese uh, could bring, primarily uh, due to lower cost. And at that time, when you read the experimental of this particular paper, you see that we just mixed lithium hydroxide, nickel oxide, and manganese oxide together and heated them up. So there was no co-precipitation happening. It was an all solid state synthesis 30 years ago. And you can see some data here for materials with 10% manganese, 20% manganese, 40% manganese, and so forth. Uh, these data are decent. They're not equivalent to what we can make today using um, co-precipitated precursors or all dry synthesis, but 30 years ago, these were pretty decent. So what happened in the meantime, though, was that uh, university researchers and industry moved to the uh, traditional co-precipitation route to make materials. And when you use co-precipitation to make hydroxide precursors followed by heating with a lithium source, you can make these very nice uh, spherical particles and you can have controlled particle size. And when you look carefully at these, uh, these, these particles, you'll see that they're made up of many smaller primary crystallites that are sort of bonded together at the interfaces. So the advantages of this method are you can make in the precursor step, the transition metals, so the nickel, manganese, and cobalt are intimately mixed at the atomic level in the hydroxide or carbonate precursor. You can make spherical particles with almost any particle size distribution. And because these different transition metals are intimately mixed, you can use a lower heating temperature with the lithium source to make a final product. And if you want, you can make very tiny uh, precursor spheres, maybe five microns or so, and then heat those to make what is called single crystal NMC, which is gaining popularity today. Uh, but there are disadvantages to this method, and these become more problematic at a larger scale. It's a fairly complicated process. There's a large amount of water use. The co-precipitation process makes a lot of waste. Sodium sulfate is the most typical. And if you are interested in ending up with single crystal NMC, you don't need these spherical particles uh, in the precursor step anyway. So I wanna talk about um, one of the issues with the co-precipitated materials, and this has to do with what's called microcracking. And to understand the origin of microcracking, you really need to understand something about the way the crystal structure of the NMC changes as lithium is inserted and removed from the structure. So if you look at the crystallographic axes A and C of the unit cell, these change as the lithium content of the material changes. As lithium goes in and out, A and C change. So how do they change? So let's look at NMC622. It's a pretty common positive electrode material. As you saw in the introductory slides, um, NMC622 is actually at this moment, the most common NMC used in lithium ion batteries in vehicles. But what you can see is that as you charge the material, 
and remove lithium, the A axis shrinks and then sort of levels out, whereas the C axis expands. And then when you get a very high voltage, it contracts very rapidly. And the problem with this is that in a traditional um, NMC material, this can lead to micro cracking because the A axis is shrinking and the C axis is expanding and you have particles at the interface between these small particles within a, a spherical uh, large particle, you get cracking or you can get cracking at the interface between the primary particles. And what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is high resolution X-ray computed, tom computed tomography images of NMC622 particles in electrodes within lithium ion cells before and after cycling. So these images were taken to by Toby Bond at the Canadian Light Source. So what we have here on the left is an image of a cell of the positive electrode particles in a cell after formation only. So you can see the particles and the resolution's pretty good. You can make out individual particles. So we have a Toby's focus on a large particle and then typical particles at another part of the electrode. Cells were cycled at C over five continuously at 40 degrees C to 25% depth of discharge for two and a half years. This racks up about 8,000 cycles. And after you take a look at these particles, there's some evidence of microcracking in them, but not too bad. By contrast, in the rightmost column, we have a situation where cells were cycled at C over five at 100% depth of discharge. So here, the lattice constant changes were maximal, and that led to a lot of microcracking. In fact, you can see the individual particles are virtually unable to be distinguished anymore. So this represents about, about 2,000 cycles uh, for this particular cell. And this is one of the issues with the traditional microstructure that microcracking can lead to this type of behavior, which leads to capacity loss. So recently there's been a push towards single crystal materials. And this is one of the most impressive uh, SEM images that I know of. And this comes from Yang Cook Sun's group at Hanyang University in Korea. And what he's showing in the lower panel is a traditional material after 100 charge discharge cycles, you can see the micro cracks in the particles. Whereas in the top panel, a single crystal positive electrode has been cross sectioned after 100 cycles, and each of the single crystal materials shows no micro cracking at all. So, what is the problem with micro cracking? The problem is that in the interior, you get regions of the crystallite that aren't the regions of the particle that are not electrically connected anymore. And this is what leads to capacity loss. Whereas in the single crystal case, there are no portions of the particles that become electrically disconnected. So this is only after 100 charge discharge cycles. What about more cycles? So we published this paper in 2019, where we worked on single crystal NMC532. And this shows cross-sectional SEM SE images SEM images of a positive electrode taken from a cell after 5,300 cycles. And you can see that in the majority of these particles, there are no micro cracks at all after these 5,300 cycles. This one big particle that we follow has a couple of big cracks. It's impossible to know if those were there at the beginning or whether they did form, but the majority of the crystals have no cracks at all. And this leads to very impressive charge discharge cycle life. So this is three years of continuous testing, single crystal NMC532 cells. The cells were tested nominally at 1C, charge and discharge, 10,000 cycles over three years, with virtually no capacity loss. Every 100 cycles, we did what's called a rate map, where cells were discharged at different C rates, and you can see even the 3C uh, capacity hardly changed at all. And if you charge to 4.2 or 4.3 volts, the situation's very similar. There's a bit more capacity loss, but over 10,000 cycles, 
it's really not very significant. And if every cycle of, of this cell represented 400 kilometers in an EV, this would be 4 million kilometers uh, total driving. And these type of things would definitely enable vehicle to grid operation of electric vehicles without any fear of battery degradation during um, vehicle to grid use. So single crystal materials bring advantages and traditional co-precipitation is not required to make single crystal materials. And several groups moved ahead with single crystal synthesis using all dry methods. This paper came along in 2020 from Mark Oberbach's group at Dalhousie University. And here's a SEM images of some of the NMC 622 that they produced using all dry methods. And here's a voltage profile, charge and discharge of the first charge discharge cycle of NMC 622. It's very competitive with uh, typical industrial NMC 622. In 2022, Jurgen Yannick's group published this particular paper where they're working on single crystal NMC nickel 83, and they show um, 200 milliamp hours per gram a reasonable rate capability, reasonable charge discharge cycle life. Again, for a material that's made in an all dry process but without any water use at all. So the papers from the Obervac and Yannick groups are very nice. And they demonstrate that single crystal materials can be made in an all dry process from simple oxide precursors. Uh, these papers didn't compare the materials head to head to materials made by traditional process. So after the Obervac paper came out, we started to work on all dry uh, methods here in uh, our group. And we wanted to use the most sensible starting materials for the synthesis that didn't push water use and co-precipitation onto some other supplier. So after some consultation, we decided nickel powder was the best nickel source. And it was very hard for us to find a fine manganese metal in the one to two micron size. So we picked electromag EMD, electrolytic manganese dioxide as the manganese source. And we worked with a supplier to um, get small size EMD for our all dry synthesis. We've published one paper that's come out so far on how to make NMC 640 using all dry synthesis. We have another paper that's in review about making NMC 730. And then a third paper in review, which talks about um, in a single step making tungsten coated NMC 730. And I'll talk to you now about some of the results in those papers. First of all, just to, just to point out why we're doing this, in the traditional synthesis, it's a fairly complex path. You start with metals or metal oxides. These are dissolved in sulfuric acid to make metal sulfates. The mixed metal sulfate solution is co-precipitated with sodium hydroxide and ammonia is added to control the particle shape and so on. At the end, you have to filter off the water and then you have to take the produced sodium sulfate and get rid of it. You can recycle the ammonia. You have to dry the filter cake. Then you finally mix in the lithium hydroxide or carbonate, do the heating step. And at the end, there's generally a washing step to remove surface residuals, and then maybe a coating and reheating step again to put a coating on the material. So pretty complicated, a lot of CapEx involved. And what we've developed is what we call the adios method. It's all dry in one step and adios to water, no water used at all, at all. So you start with metals or oxides and you mix in the coating precursor right at the beginning mix in a lithium source, do the heating, you get your single crystals, you crush and jet mill, you get a fine powder, and then we do a reheating step to, um, to reincorporate any surface residual lithium that might appear during the jet milling stage. 
So very simple. The starting materials that we use are a, a fine nickel powder, and like I mentioned, a small size EMD. And these reactants need to be pretty small to allow for good mixing with the lithium precursor and short reaction times at high temperature. We also optionally can include ammonium metatungstate to give us uh, tungsten containing materials as a coating. Um, the synthesis is very simple. We just mix nickel, EMD, lithium hydroxide, and optional ammonium metatungstate with an auto grinder. We heat at 950 for 12 hours. This has not been optimized. Then we jet mill. Then we reheat at 750 under oxygen for five hours. Also, the time is not optimized. No washing at all. The particles are ready to go. Uh, typically, we use a lithium to transition metal ratio somewhere around 1.16 to 1.24. Uh, you would need higher levels to compensate uh, for lithium loss due to lithium tungstate surface phases if you use ammonium tungstate. And just to point out that these ratios are not uh, out of line, typical vendor materials would have a lithium to transition metal ratio of about 1.17. Uh, before jet milling, we have a pretty lousy particle size distribution as expected, but after jet milling, our materials in red uh, match the particle size distribution of a vendor material in black. These are some SEMs of what these particles look like. Um, this L116 means the lithium to transition metal ratio is 1.16, 1.18, 1.2, and so forth. So there's SEM images shown of materials that are made without tungsten, and then materials that have 0 0.3 mole percent of tungsten initially added as ammonium metatungstate. And you can see the inclusion of tungsten allows one to reduce the size of the particles so that they basically exactly match the vendor material. Then we are worried about residual lithium compounds found on the surface. So we do titration and determine the surface residual uh, content. And you can see the pristine material after the furnace, after jet milling, and then after jet milling and reheating. After jet milling and reheating, the surface residuals are very small and they match the levels in vendor materials made by traditional methods. Here's some data showing voltage versus capacity curves for NMC640. This is for materials uh, charge and discharge between three and 4.2 volts. There's uh, two materials with and without tungsten being shown here. You can see when the tungsten added, we get a bit more specific capacity. I think that's because the particles are smaller and diffusion paths are shorter compares quite well to the vendor material. And if we go to 4.4 volts, the materials made by the all dry process, again, compare favorably to the vendor material. In terms of charge discharge cycling, at 4.2 volts, the all dry materials compare virtually identically to the vendor material. And at 4.4 volts, the same is true. In fact, if you look at the normalized capacity, it may be the case that uh, the materials made by the all dry process are beating uh, the vendor material, even after the vendor material has been reheated. So these materials have good performance or equal or better to the vendor material. And that's, that's really nice. A simple process leads to good material. Uh, just to convince you that NMC640 is a material that makes sense to, uh, to make, these are pouch cell results um, create, created using the vendor material. Uh, we don't make enough material for a, a pouch cell coating run. But anyway, you can see here for cells tested at 40 degrees C, charged to 4.4 volts at C over three, get over a thousand cycles to 80%. And the internal impedance of the cells increases almost doubles over that period. Things are much better if they're only charged to 4.3 or 4.2, but even to 4.4, things are pretty, pretty useful. 
this material is interesting because it's a medium nickel material, lower cost, less worry about nickel availability. As I showed you, can be made by the all dry synthesis, lower cost, better for the environment. Cycle life is acceptable for EV, that 4.3 and 4.4. And to be honest, uh, you know, most EVs are set up where you're charging to 100% only when you're going on a long trip. And we've measured the manganese dis dissolution from these materials after this long-term cycling. It's very low, less than other NMC grades. So a low risk of soft shorts. It's a very interesting material. We spent the time to make NMC 730 as well. These are SEM images after the first heating, after the jet milling, and then after the reheating step, and compared to a vendor material. Here we compare the first charge and discharge material of the all dry synthesis to the vendor material, matches very well. And also at C over five matches very well. And we've made um, half cell studies of the all dry synthesis compared to the vendor material. And these are with lithium negative electrodes going to 4.4 volts and they match up very well. So it appears that we can make single crystal NMC640 and 730s by this adios method that are equivalent to vendor materials made from precursors made by the traditional method. Uh, we've done some life cycle analysis and we're not very expert at this, so I'm not showing it. But the outcome of this, based on the synthesis of one metric ton of NMC730, starting from the ore and going to the product, 23% less CO2 produced, 19% less energy used, and 55% more water uh, used. You might wonder in the all dry system why water is used at all, but remember we're starting from the ore and going to the product. And this does not consider the reduced capex or the reduced amount of waste that is being produced. So I'm aware of the following single crystal materials being mass produced in China today. Mass produced means on the scale of 50,000 tons thereabouts or more. And there's probably many more grades than these. These are the ones that I know about, 532640. 631, nickel 83, nickel, nickel 95. And in my opinion, all these materials can be made by the all dry process. I've shown the benefits of single crystal materials over traditional materials, micro cracking's eliminated, much better long-term capacity retention. It only stands to reason that this adios method will be adopted worldwide. So why is this important for the Nickel Institute? The Nickel Institute should realize that there's going to be a demand for uh, precursors other than nickel sulfate at a large scale. So that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. And I don't know if there's any time for questions. Maybe there is, but if there are, I'd happy, be happy to take them. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Jeff, for the excellent insights and the impressive data. Uh, we see that the use of single crystal NMC can effectively improve cycling performance and, and all dry method has environmental advantages. We do have several questions. We have, a, we have time for a couple, so um, I'll start. Um, how important specific are the PCAM characteristics uh, in terms of particle size and shape for Adios method? Yeah, the... The size, I think, is the most important. You want to be down around one to two microns for the precursors in this adios method, just to limit the amount of uh, heating time that you need to make the uniform product. In terms of shape, I don't think it's too important. Uh, we haven't explored shape too much. We've looked at two different types of nickel. One is very filamentary, and one is more round, round particles. And we've been able to make good material from both. Um, thank you. Uh, so another question, you have a long record of successful industry collaboration uh, with Tesla and others. 
how can the industry stakeholders get involved in terms of the million mile battery, new basically industry stakeholders? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I would say mm -hmm. that <laughs> you, um, you want to demonstrate that your materials are are useful and then you can get involved and maybe that means you work with a, a company that can evaluate ma your materials and and show that they bring advantages to the table mm -hmm. um so one last question because there's so many questions i'm just screening uh, can the adios method be applied to other layered cathode materials uh chemistries yeah, I think so. You know, I just I see no reason that it can't be applied to NCA or for that matter, even sodium ion. You know, sodium ion um, is a situation where a lot of the materials that are available now are are single crystals right from from the from the get-go. So there's no reason that you can't focus on on this method right from the start. I think it's widely applicable. Um, you know, it, it takes a bit of time to sort of figure out how, how to do it well. And, um, you know, we're a university lab. We have not tried to scale this to large, uh, large scale. And I'm sure there'll be hurdles to overcome during that process. But I think the, the writing's on the wall that it, you can make it work. And the benefits that it will bring are very large. So it's worth, worth the effort to try to make it work. Thanks a lot. Um, I think that we now need to move on. Um, thanks to the audience for their engagement. There's questions are still coming in. So uh, thanks again, uh, Jeff. Um, very much appreciate your insights. Okay, have a great day, everyone.